Welcome everyone to episode 89 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host Matthew, and I've got another wild one for you guys today. The woman in this story is the basis for the movie Monster. I'm talking about Eileen Wernos. But first, a bit of news. The two-year anniversary of the podcast is coming up in October. And for the anniversary episode, I would really like to make it all about my listeners. So if you have any kind of paranormal encounter story or just a you know ghost story that you've written yourself and you would like to have it shared, I would love to read it for the anniversary episode. All you have to do is send your story to Ohio underscore unsolved at yahoo.com. So now let's just get right into the episode. Everyone sit back, make sure to lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. This first story is a little graphic. I will keep details to a minimum, but listener discretion is always advised. Eileen Carol Wernos was an American serial killer. In 1989 to 1990, while engaging in street prostitution along highways in Florida, she shot dead and robbed seven of her male clients. Wernos claimed that her clients had either raped or attempted to rape her, and that the homicides of the men were committed in self-defense. Eileen was sentenced to death for six of the murders. She was executed on October 9, 2002 by lethal injection after spending more than 10 years on Florida's death row. Wernos was born Eileen Carol Pittman on February 29th 1956 in Rochester, Michigan. Her mother, Diane Wernos, was 14 years old when she married Eileen's father, 18-year-old Leo Pittman, on June 3, 1954. On March 14, 1955, Diane gave birth to Eileen's older brother, Keith. After less than two years of marriage and two months before Eileen was born, Diane filed for divorce. She gave, to birth, she gave birth to Eileen at the age of 16. Eileen never met her father. Leo Pittman was later sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping and raping a seven-year-old girl. Pittman was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He committed suicide by hanging in prison on January 30, 1969. In January 1960, when Eileen was almost four years old, Diane abandoned her children, leaving them with their maternal grandparents, Lori and Britta Wernos, both alcoholics who legally adopted Keith and Eileen on March 18, 1960. By the age of 11, Eileen began engaging in sexual activities in school in exchange for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She had also engaged in sexual activities with her brother. Eileen said that her alcoholic grandfather had sexually assaulted and beaten her when she was a child. Before beating her, he would force her to strip out of her clothes. In 1970, at the age of 14, she became pregnant, having been raped by a family friend. Eileen gave birth to a boy at a home for unwed mothers on March 23, 1971. 
and the child was placed for adoption. A few months after her son was born, she dropped out of school at about the same time that her grandmother died of liver failure. When Eileen was 15, her grandfather threw her out of the house, and she began living in the woods near her old home and supported herself through prostitution. On May 27, 1974, at the age of 18, Eileen was arrested in Jefferson County, Colorado, for driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, and firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving vehicle. She was later charged with failure to appear. In 1976, Eileen hitchhiked to Florida, where she met 69-year-old Yacht Club president Louis Gratzfell. They married quickly, and the announcement of their nuptials was printed in the local newspaper's society pages. Eileen continually involved herself in confrontations at their local bar, and went to jail briefly for assault. She also hit Fell with his own cane, leading him to gain a restraining order against her within weeks of the marriage. She returned to Michigan, where on July 14, 1976, she was arrested at Bernie's Club in Antrim County and charged with assault and disturbing the peace for throwing a cue ball at a bartender's head. On July 17, her brother Keith died of esophageal cancer, and Eileen received $10,000 from his life insurance. Eileen and Fell annulled their marriage on July 21st, after only nine weeks. In August of 76, Eileen was given a $105 fine for drunk driving. She used the money inherited from her brother to pay the fine, and spent the rest within two months, buying luxuries including a new car, which she wrecked shortly afterwards. In 1978, at the age of 22, she attempted suicide by shooting herself in the stomach. Between the ages of 14 and 22, she attempted suicide six times. On May 20th, 1981, Eileen was arrested in Edgewater, Florida for the armed robbery of a convenience store where she stole $35 and two packs of cigarettes. She was sentenced to prison on May 4th, 1982 and released on June 30th, 1983. On May 1, 1984, Eileen was then arrested for attempting to pass forged checks at a bank in Key West. On November 30, 1985, she was named as a suspect in the theft of a revolver and ammunition in Pasco County. On January 4, 1986, Eileen was arrested in Miami and charged with car theft resisting arrest and obstruction of justice for providing identification bearing her aunt's name. Miami police officers found a 38 caliber revolver and a box of ammunition in the stolen car. On June 2, 1986, Volusia County Deputy Sheriffs detained Eileen for questioning after a male companion accused her of pulling a gun in his car and demanding $200. Eileen was found to be carrying spare ammunition and police discovered a 22 caliber pistol under the passenger seat that she had occupied. In 1986, 30-year-old Eileen met 24-year-old Tyra Moore, a motel maid at a Daytona Beach gay bar called Zodiac. They moved in together and Eileen supported them with her earnings as a prostitute. On July 4th, 1987, Daytona Beach Police detained Eileen and Moore at a bar for questioning regarding an incident in which they were accused of assault and battery with a beer bottle. On March 12, 1988, Eileen accused a Daytona Beach bus driver of assault. She claimed that he pushed her off the bus following a confrontation. Moore was listed as a witness to the incident. Later at her trial, Eileen stated, it was love beyond imaginable. Earthly words cannot describe how I felt about Tyra. Before her execution, Eileen claimed to still be in love with her. Eileen murdered seven men within a period of 12 months. All the men were motorists between the ages of 40 and 65. Richard Charles Mallory, aged 51, was an electronic store owner in Clearwater. 
Eileen claimed that Mallory beat, raped, and sodomized her after he drove her to an abandoned area for sexual services. Mallory was Eileen's first victim, and she claimed to have killed him in self-defense. Later, it became known that Mallory had previously been convicted for attempted rape in Maryland. Two days after the murder, a Volusia County Deputy Sheriff found Mallory's abandoned vehicle. On December 13th, his body was found several miles away in a wooded area. He had been shot several times, and two bullets to the left lung were found to have been the cause of death. David Andrew Spears, age 47, was a construction worker in Winter Garden. He was declared missing as of May 19, 1990. On June 1, 1990, his naked body was found along US-19 in Citrus County. He had been shot six times by a 22 caliber pistol. Charles Edmund Carsacton, age 40, was a part-time rodeo worker. On June 6, 1990, his body was found in Pasco County. He had been shot nine times with a 22 caliber weapon. The body had been wrapped in an electric blanket and was badly decomposing when found. Witnesses saw Eileen in possession of Cardoxon's car and Eileen had also pawned a gun identified as belonging to him. Peter Abraham Seams, age 65, was a retired merchant seaman. In June 1990, Peter left Jupiter, Florida for Arkansas. On July 4th, 1990, his car was found in Orange Springs, Florida. Moore and Eileen were seen abandoning the car, and Eileen's palm print was found on the interior door handle. His body was never found. Troy Eugene Burris, age 50, was a sausage salesman from Ocala, Florida. On July 31st, 1990, he was reported missing. On August 4th, 1990, his body was found in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. He had been shot twice. Charles Richard Humphreys, age 56, was a retired U.S. Air Force Major, former state child abuse investigator, and former chief of police. On Sunday, September 12, 1990, his body was found in Marion County. He was fully clothed and had been shot seven times in the head and torso. His car was found in Suwannee County. Walter Antonio, age 62, was a trucker, security guard, and reserve police officer. On November 19, 1990, Antonio's nearly naked body was found near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He had been shot four times. Five days later, his his car was found in Brevard County. On July 4, 1990, Eileen and Tyra Moore abandoned victim Peter Seam's car after they were involved in an accident. Rhonda Bailey, who witnessed the accident, provided the police with a description of two women, which later led to a media campaign to locate them. Police also found some of the victim's belongings in pawn shops. Eileen's fingerprint that was found on a receipt at one of the pawn shops matched the print that was left in the car. Eileen had a criminal record in Florida, and samples of her prints were already in the database. On January 9, 1991, Eileen was arrested at the Last Resort Biker Bar in Volusia County on the pretext of an outstanding warrant in the name of Lori Grody. Police located Moore the next day in Pittston, Pennsylvania, where she agreed to elicit a confession from Eileen in exchange for immunity from prosecution. Moore returned with the police to Florida, where she was put up in a motel. Under police guidance, she made numerous telephone calls to Eileen, pleading for help in clearing her name. Three days later, on January 16th, Eileen confessed to the murders. She claimed the men had tried to rape her, and she killed them in self-defense. In November 91, Eileen was legally adopted by 44-year-old Arlene Prowl, who saw her photo in a newspaper. 
According to some specialists, Eileen's crimes have been related to her psychopathic personality and her psychotraumatic past. Assessed with using psychopathy checklist, Eileen scored 32 out of 40 with a cutoff score of 30 for determining psychopathy. Eileen was also known to meet the relevant criteria for determining borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Much of Eileen's childhood sexual abuse and career and sex work are said to have irrevocably damaged her, and it could be seen that traumatic experiences throughout most of her young life could play a part in her psychological state, including her biological mother's departure as well as her grandmother ignoring the abuse that she endured from her grandfather, thus leading to the lack of development of a mother-daughter bond for Eileen as a young girl. The damage was then made worse because both Eileen and her brother believed that their grandparents were their biological parents, but at the age of 11 they learned that this was not the case, which further damaged the relationship between Eileen and her adoptive parents. Eileen was also known to have early behavioral problems such as having an explosive temper, which limited her ability to make friends, as well as making it increasingly difficult for her to maintain relationships. Her traumatic upbringing, including her physical and sexual abuse, have been partially linked to the development of her borderline personality disorder. Such severe trauma can also disrupt the structuralization of the mind at various developmental points and result in primitive, dissociative, and splitting defenses to ward off the intensity of emotional and sexual stimulation that cannot be integrated as a child. FBI profiler Robert Ressler briefly mentions Eileen in his autobiographical history of his 20 years with the FBI. Writing in 1992, he said he often does not discuss female serial killers because they tend to kill in sprees instead of in a se sequential fashion. He noted Eileen as the sole exception. Ressler, who allegedly coined the phrase serial killer to describe murderers seeking personal gratification, does not apply it to women killing in postpartum psychosis or to any murderer acting solely for financial gain, such as women who have killed a series of boarders or spouses. On January 14, 1992, Eileen went to trial for the murder of Richard, Richard Charles Mallory. Although previous convictions are normally inadmissible in criminal trials, under Florida's Williams Rule, the prosecution was allowed to introduce evidence related to her other crimes to show a pattern of illegal activity. On January 27, 1992, Eileen was convicted of Mallory's murder with help from Moore's testimony. At her sentencing, psychiatrists for the defense testified that Eileen was mentally unstable and diagnosed her with borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Four days later, she was sentenced to death. Eileen's defense made efforts during the trial to introduce evidence that Mallory was previously convicted for attempted rape in Maryland and served a sentence in a maximum security correctional facility providing remediation to sexual offenders. Records obtained from the correctional institution showed that from 1958 to 1962, Mallory was committed for treatment and observation resulting from a criminal charge of assault with intent to rape. These records also reflect eight years of overall treatment from the facility. In 1961, it was observed of Mr. Mallory that he possessed strong so sociopathic trends. However, the judge refused to allow the records to be admitted in court as evidence and denied Eileen's request for a retrial. <clears throat> On March 31, 1992, Eileen pleaded no contest to the murders of Charles Humphreys, Troy Burris, and David Spears, saying she wanted to, quote, get right with God. In her statement to the court, she said in part, 
I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me as I've told you. But these others did not. They only began to start to. On May 15th, 92, Eileen was given three more death sentences. In June of 92, Eileen pled guilty to the murder of Charles Edmund Carsacton. In November of 92, she received her fifth death sentence. In February 1993, she pled guilty to the murder of Walter Antonio and was sentenced to death again. No charges were brought against her for the murder of Peter Seams, as his body was never found. In all, Eileen received six death sentences. Eileen told several inconsistent stories about the killings. She claimed initially that all seven men had either raped or attempted to rape her while she was working as a prostitute, but later recanted the, recanted the claim of self-defense citing robbery and a desire to leave no witnesses as the reason for murder. During an interview with filmmaker Nick Broomfield, when Eileen thought the cameras were off, she told him that it was, in fact, self-defense, but she could not stand being on death row, where she had been for 10 years at that point and wanted to die. Eileen was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections Broward Correctional Institution death row for women. Then she was transferred to the Florida State Prison for execution. Her appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was denied in 1996. In a 2001 petition to the Florida Supreme Court, she stated her intention to dismiss her legal counsel and terminate all pending appeals. I killed those men, she wrote. Rob them as cold as ice, and I'd do it again, too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I am so sick of hearing this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. While her attorneys argued that she was not mentally competent to make such a request, Eileen insisted that she knew what she was doing, and a court-appointed panel of psychiatrists agreed. In 2002, Eileen began accusing prison matrons of tainting her food with dirt, saliva, and urine. She said that she had overheard conversations among prison personnel trying to get me so pushed over the brink by them I'd wind up committing suicide before the execution and wishing to rape me before execution. She also complained of strip searches, tight handcuffing, door kicking, frequent window checks, low water pressure, mildew on her mattress, and cat calling in distaste and a pure hatred towards me. Eileen threatened to boycott showers and food trays when certain officers were on duty. In the meantime, my stomach's growling away and I'm taking showers through the sink of my cell. Her attorney stated that Miss Wurnos really just wants to have proper treatment, humane treatment, until the day she's executed. He added, she believes what she's written. In the weeks before her execution, Eileen gave a series of interviews to documentarian Nick Broomfield and talked about, quote, being taken away to meet God and Jesus and the angels and whatever is beyond the beyond. In her final interview, she once again charged that her mind was, quote, tortured at BCI and her head crushed by sonic pressure. Food poisonings and other abuses wor worsened. She said each time she complained with the goal of making her appear insane or to drive her insane. She also turned on her interviewer. You sabotaged my ass, security and the cops and the system. A raped woman got executed and was used for books and movies and shit. Her final on-camera words were, Thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. Don Botkins, a childhood friend of Eileen, 
later told Broomfield that her verbal abuse was directed at society and the media in general, not at him specifically. Eileen's execution by lethal injection took place on October 9, 2002. She declined her last meal, which could have been anything under $20, and opted for a cup of coffee instead. Her last words were, Yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock, and I'll be back, like Independence Day, with Jesus. June 6, like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back, I'll be back. She died at 9.47 a.m. After her death, Eileen's body was cremated. Her ashes were scattered beneath a tree in her native Michigan by Eileen's childhood friend Don Botkins. At Eileen's request, Natalie Merchant's song Carnival from her album Tiger Lily was played at her funeral. Eileen spent many hours listening to this album on death row. When Merchant found out about this, she gave permission to use a song in the closing credits of Nick Broomfield's documentary, Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer. When director Nick Broomfield sent a working edit of the film, I was so disturbed by the subject matter that I couldn't even watch it. Eileen Wernos led a tortured, torturing life that is beyond my worst nightmares. It wasn't until I was told that Eileen spent many hours listening to my album, Tiger Lily, while on death row and requested Carnival be played at her funeral, that I gave permission for the use of the song. It's very odd to think of the places my music can go once it leaves my hands. If it gave her some solace, I have to be grateful. Broomfield later speculated on Eileen's state of mind and motives. I think this anger developed inside her, and she was working as a prostitute. I think she had a lot of awful encounters on the roads, and I think this anger just spilled out from inside her and finally exploded into incredible violence. That was her way of surviving. I think Eileen really believed that she had killed in self-defense. I think somebody who's deeply psychotic can't really tell the difference between something that is life-threatening and something that is a minor disagreement. That you could say something that she didn't agree with. She would get into a screaming black temper about it. And I think that's what caused these things to happen. And at the same time, when she wasn't in those extreme moods, there was an incredible humanity to her. My next story comes from YourGhostStories.com, and it's called The Park Street Apartment. My older sister Sam rented a two-bedroom apartment on South Park Street in Madison, Wisconsin during her junior year at UW. There was a beautiful corner window in the living room, but a huge pine tree blocked the window from the busy street. Whenever Sam called me, she would be in tears and telling me about the latest ghostly figure that she'd seen. I would brush it off my shoulders and roll my eyes at this. After months of Sam begging me to visit her, I finally did. When she opened the front door, my eyes were automatically glued to the hallway and all the little hair on my back neck stood up. Sam gave me a tour of her place opening closets to show me how much space she had and trying to convince me to move in with her. When she opened her bedroom walk-in closet, I felt goosebumps on my arm. I told her to close it right away because I had a feeling that someone hung themselves in there. That summer, my parents dropped off my two little sisters to stay with her. Sam's the irresponsible one in our family. That weekend, she felt so stressed out that she decided to leave the two little sisters at the apartment in a new big city while she went to the clubs with some friends. My little sisters were excited to be left alone without adult supervision. At around midnight, one fell asleep on the futon while the other watched TV until her eyes couldn't stay open anymore 
and she lay next to her sister. After a few minutes, one was woken up by the sound of clunking of high heels on concrete coming towards the front door. She also heard voices of women talking and laughing and the sound of keys sliding through the keyhole. Palm was happy that Sam was back. She waited there in the dark. The front door never opened. Palm dashed to the corner window to look and see if Sam's car was back. It wasn't. She saw something else. A dark figure was sitting next to the huge pine tree. She noticed the outline of the figure to be a little girl who had curly hair and a puffy dress. Palm screamed, waking up him, and the both of them held each other and cried. Not more than five minutes later, they heard voices and high heels on concrete. Then the front door opened with Sam and her friends walking through the door. The girls never went back to stay with her. When I moved in with Sam, we both shared her room. I slept on the top bunk. Sam situated her computer in the corner desk so that when you sat down to use a computer, your back would be facing the walk-in closet door and the bedroom door. Every time I'm on that computer, I have the tendency of turning around because I would feel someone was looking at me from the doorway. All of my friends thought that I was going crazy because I was cooped in there with Sam, who they thought was a little lunatic. They came over once to cheer me up. We were all sitting on Sam's bottom bunk, talking and laughing. When even We even put on a little music. One of my friends cranked up the music and started to dance. The rest of the girls joined. The music faded shortly. It's as though someone turned down the volume. This happened several times. We got scared and ran out to the living room. We all heard the door slam and my friend who ran out last was screaming. She said that she felt something pushing her out and the door slammed on its own. Months went by. Sam and I got used to living with the others. All our friends still came over to give support to be with us so we wouldn't freak out. Sam saw the figures the most. Sometimes, when the figures saw her, they were scared as well. It got to the point where I would hear Sam talking to herself or cursing and screaming at the top of her lungs. When I ran to see what was the matter, she'd tell me that she was yelling at the figures to go back to hell. The two of us thought that we were really losing it until my entire family moved in temporarily for two weeks until they could get into their new home. My older brother set up his computer in the living room. Each night after work, he'd stay on it until 2 or 3 in the morning. One night, I was watching David Letterman while he was on his computer. After about an hour, I turned off the TV and I headed to my room. Several minutes later, he came in and asked if I'd turn off the TV. I told him I did. We walked together to the living room and the TV was turned on but it wasn't on any channel. It was just fuzzy. He turned it off and I headed back to bed. Each night after that, the TV would turn on by itself and it would be fuzzy. He checked the circuits and he made sure that nothing would trigger it to turn on, even keeping the remote next to him. Still, it turned on by itself. After that started happening, the computer in our room would turn on by itself. Nights when I completely shut down the computer and unplugged the power cord, it would still turn on by itself, even if the power cord was not plugged in. There was someone or something that was messing with us for its amusement. My little niece, who was only three years old at the time, would run around the apartment, laughing and playing by herself. When I asked her what she was doing, she'd tell me that she was playing with her new friend. She was too young to be having an imaginary friend. One morning, I found her on the second bedroom under the covers. I heard her saying that she's going to tell her mom something if her friend wasn't going to behave. When I uncovered the comforter, I found my little niece sitting by herself, but she had scratches on her face. 
as if tiny little fingernails dug deep into her cheeks. The last week, when my family was to move into their new home, my mom slept on Sam's bed on the bottom bunk while Sam was on our computer. My mom woke up, but just staring around the room, and she didn't stir in bed. She saw a person standing by the bedroom doorway, and she thought it was Sam. But when she looked closer, it was a little blonde-haired girl who was wearing a puffy Victorian dress with black buckled shoes and a big bow in her hair standing there looking towards Sam. My mom said that the little girl reminded her of the Alice in Wonderland, but she had curly hair. The little girl turned around and disappeared into the hallway. That alone answered many questions that we had about why we always felt eerie when we were on the computer or why the computer and TV would turn on. And who was playing with my little niece? We are still trying to find out what happened there and who the girl was. When I drive past the apartment complex, I still get goosebumps to this day. My last story, also from yourghoststories.com, is called House on Erie Road. One of the most powerful experiences happened in my mid to late 20s, shortly after my divorce from Bob, my first husband. I met John as a blind date, and amazingly, we immediately clicked. He fell for me at first sight. It was a second marriage for both of us and it took us a few months to get adjusted to each other, but we were so very much alike it was spooky, pardon the pun. He was living in a house on Erie Road, not too far from downtown Willoughby, Ohio. This particular house I was familiar with since I was a kid. The neighborhood kids and I used to ride our bicycles past that house on Erie Road in the summer months. Every time I looked at that house, I got the crawling scalp. I could just sense something wrong about it. My gaze was usually drawn to the third floor upstairs window that I later discovered was an attic. I felt something up there to be looking back at me and letting me know, yes, I'm here, just keep on writing. I instinctively knew the house was haunted. Not just because it was a decrepit, rundown dwelling over a hundred years old, but because I just felt it. Many years later, I never imagined that I'd actually be living there with my second husband and his mother, Mary. Mary was divorced from Tom, her second husband, and needed somewhere to live. John and his sister, Jean, invited her to live with them. John and Jean are the ones who originally found the house and rented the upstairs portion. It was an old farmhouse that was converted into up and down apartments. However, when John and I got together, Jean had married and moved out. Mary was a wonderful mother-in-law, and on top of that, she was incredibly psychic. John was psychic, and I, likewise, was slightly psychic. Now you get three psychic individuals in a haunted environment with an electric electrical power substation in a wooded area not even 80 yards behind the house and you're looking at paranormal disaster as we were later to find out it started out innocuous enough with very little drawing our attention we just shrugged those little things off however the more we settled into a home life routine the more things began to get noticed incidents like a ports that is to say, solid objects disappearing into thin air and turning up in the most unlikely places. When you put a coffee pot on the stove, leave the room for a few seconds, go back, the pot is gone and cannot be found anywhere. A day later, said coffee pot turns up in the refrigerator. Give me a break. All sorts of items were going missing to be found hours or days later. We'd hear our names called with no one there, being touched with no one nearby, hearing sounds that cannot be accounted for. 
going away for a few hours and coming home to the kitchen floor having two inches of ice cold water on it. No water was left running, there was no rain, and the roof didn't leak. We began to doubt our sanity until we realized that the house was, in fact, haunted. Mary, being Catholic, sprinkled holy water around, but it may as well have been chocolate syrup. In fact, things escalated to a fever pitch. Outbreaks of millions of baby spiders swarming all over the ceiling of John and mine's bedroom. Later, there was the outbreak of millions, no exaggeration, of millipedes. Little wire worms crawling all over the inside and outside of the house, even spilling out into the front yard. Super nightmare. Another time, I was alone in the living room, seated on the couch with the dog, Bumpy, at my feet, reading a book. Suddenly, she rose, stared at the ceiling, and began a low growling with all the hackles on her back raised and trembling against my legs. From the far end of the house, directly over the kitchen, I heard up in the attic heavy footsteps. It sounded like a very large man with work boots on walking from that end to the, to the living room right over my head. I even heard the boots squeal as they did a 180 and marched slowly back over the kitchen area. That was too much. I tore out of the living room, down the hall, through the kitchen, and into the imagined safety of the bathroom with the poor dog hot on my heels. Her and I just waited in the bathroom for John to come back home. We burst out of the bathroom and I excitedly told him what had just transpired. He grabbed a bat and went up to the attic. I followed him. Of course, there was no human intruder found. I knew that there wouldn't be either. In the attic directly behind the railing at the top of the stairs was a tremendous cold cubicle. It was about five feet wide and eight feet deep. In the summer months, the temperature up there rose to almost 120 degrees. Yet, in that one area behind the railing, it was like a meat locker. You could stick your arm in and feel the ice cold and see your breath. We deduced that the thing was concentrated in that area for the most part. However, it still had the ability to make us miserable. It began to affect our moods in the most negative ways. We'd fight for the most inconsequential things leave the house, and then wonder why we fought in the first place. It even drove John to drinking and charging up the steps to the attic to do battle with it. I managed to sober him up, calm him down, and rationalize with him. We made the decision to sell whatever we could to earn extra money in addition to our work paychecks and get out. If something doesn't want you there, you cannot reason with it. Just get out. When we found a nice mobile home in West Park, Cleveland, we loaded up the car with all of our belongings and two dogs and left so fast that we left a vapor trail behind us. We never looked back. It took us the better part of a year living in the trailer, adjusting to relative normalcy, to stop jumping at our own shadows. This is no Amityville horror. This really happened. No one would live in the house too long after we left and it was sold to a preacher that turned it into a church. I hope that the religious influence has made a dramatic difference, but we wouldn't even drive by that place anymore. To those of you that are skeptics, no amount of convincing will sway you. However, to those of you that are dealing with or have dealt with something like this, I'm sure that you more than understand. Well, that is going to do it for today's episode. I hope that everyone enjoyed the stories. And if you did, could you please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts? A five-star rating really helps others to find us. Don't forget to join us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube. 
Thank you in advance for subscribing on YouTube and helping me to eventually reach my goal of 500 subscribers. Remember, once we hit 500, there will be a YouTube exclusive bonus episode, so you're not going to want to miss that. If you do enjoy the show, please consider helping to support us by joining on Patreon with monthly bonus episodes being available from the $5 tier. Once again, thank you all for listening, and make sure to keep your doors and windows locked, and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved.